The Conservative Party's new leader will be announced tomorrow. There were questions, of course, about whether or not the event would go ahead as planned given the passing of Queen Elizabeth and the national period of mourning. But the event, the party says, will reflect that. Five candidates are vying for the top job. Scott Aitchison, Roman Baber, Jean Charest, Leslin Lewis and Pierre Polyev. Rob Batherson is president of the Conservative Party of Canada and he's here now. Look, no way around it. A really seminal event obviously taking place uh, yesterday with the Queen's passing. How will your event change to reflect that? Obviously, we're rolling out now a leadership election event that will be respectful, that will recognize Her Majesty's 70 years of service. And when someone has been a head of state for 70 years, uh, there isn't a Canadian who doesn't have an opinion, a connection in some way. And so uh, the program has changed, but what hasn't changed is uh, we will have the same uh, speakers that we were planning to have and ultimately it will be about, about the release of the leadership election results and finding out who our new Conservative Party leader is and who the new leader will be of Her Majesty, His Majesty's loyal opposition. It, 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 we're all getting there, used to right? that. Yeah, yeah, we certainly are. Uh, we, I know yesterday there had been some discussions about whether it could be delayed or not. We had John Baird on here actually to speak obviously about the Queen and he thought, well, there's the possibility that the results could be leaked because they're tabulated because it was a, a mail-in ballot and so his his gut said that, the, that it would go ahead. Is that what drove you to ultimately decide that the event had to take place tomorrow night? I think looking at the protocol, the protocol allows for events to take place in a respectful way. Uh, we'll make sure that people will have the ability to, uh, to mark uh, Her Majesty's passing and, and demonstrate respect morning. Um, but yes, we have over a thousand people who are scheduled to attend. We have results to share. Uh, the democratic process has unfolded. And in many ways, in our own way, it's a reflection of the constitutional monarchy that we operate under and our institutions of government. And this is Canada's official opposition uh, announcing its new leader. So we're doing our part to continue to, to move forward, I think, as uh, Her Majesty would want to see her uh, citizens do. And, and on the process, just so for viewers who maybe aren't sure how, how it, it worked, uh, it's a mail-in ballot. Mm -hmm. Have they already been tabulated and then a button is turned to count them? How, do, how does it work? So in terms of the mechanics, uh, there has been counting uh, taking place once all of the uh, verifications were done. The deadline to receive a ballot for counting was uh, 5 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, uh, September 6th. So, uh, so there will be, without getting into all the specifics, uh, there will be a, a, a button pressed uh, to, uh, to see the tabulation. And, uh, and it's a little complicated because it's not a straight count all the votes per candidate. Every electoral district gets 100 points. So you could have 3,000 votes in, in one riding, count the same on a percentage basis versus 500 in, in another riding. And so uh, tell me if you could, uh, as, uh, as honestly as possible, mm -hmm. because you and I both remember the last time around mm -hmm. when things went on much longer than anticipated, mm -hmm. if your sense is that can be navigated this time, that that will be navigated, or if you have a, a tiny bit of concern that you could be in for something similar. So far, so good. It's been very smooth in the counting room, and I think uh, one of the adjustments was made that because of the high number of votes, uh, uh, keeping in mind that 678,000 ballots were mailed out, uh, we received uh, uh, to count that were valid votes in excess of 417, I think close to 418,000 votes that uh, the, the, the counting started earlier in, in a secure place so that uh, uh, we won't have to uh, worry about uh, problems with the voting machine. Uh, so the results should come out uh, quite smoothly uh, tomorrow evening after 7 o'clock Eastern. Okay, I'm going to make sure I have that clip to play in case it doesn't go so well. Uh, it's right, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, uh, and you, that's when Ian Brody from Leoc will come and explain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, look, I wanted to ask you a few questions about the party as a whole, especially moving past mm -hmm. the actual outcome of the vote as, as the party president. Uh, and, and I know that it's your job to say that the party will be unified and is unified, and maybe that will be the case. But, you know my job well. <laughs> but the race so far, and certainly in the first half, uh, saw some people that our viewers will be really familiar with being very outspoken about uh, their concerns about the divisive nature of it. And then also, in particular, some Charest supporters saying, I'm not so sure if I'm going to be able to stick around under a Polyev-led 
Democrat-led party. Uh, and I'm wondering if you see that uh, as a big challenge for the party going ahead. And if you're worried about, and I'm not saying it's a 50-50 split by any you know, stretch of the imagination, but if you're worried about a splintering off. I would say this isn't our first leadership election. There are always natural debates and divisions that arise uh, in, in any leadership race. Uh, I saw that in 2004, Stephen Harper, Belinda Stronach, Tony Clement. Uh, I saw that in the former PC party, and I'm sure my friends uh, in the Conservative Party who were members of the Reform Party of the Alliance would have seen that in their uh, respective uh, leadership races. One thing that I've heard from grassroots Conservative members from coast to coast to coast is a strong resolve to come out of this weekend united, a strong resolve to come together in support of the new leader, and a strong resolve to make the case for change. Canadians are very tired of a seven-year-old government, and obviously I don't want to get overly partisan uh, as we mourn Her Majesty, but I think there is a desire for change in Canada, and I think most party members that I speak to are quite resolved and, and they support the, the full spectrum of the five uh, leadership candidates, but they want to get to work in support of our new leader to make the case for change. Whenever that comes, we hear rumors of a, a fall election that may be triggered. We see some saber rattling uh, from, uh, from the NDP in terms of their coalition partner and the Liberals. So uh, when the new leader's elected, our attention has to turn to uh, election readiness whenever that comes. Let me, let me try once more to, to, to push off the partisan hat and ask you, if that election does come, by all signs through uh, cabinet, the cabinet retreat last week, the prime minister is prepared to lead his party against whomever wins. I think the assumption of, of a lot of people is that it will, and I know you're not going to comment on that, <laughs> is that it will, will be Pierre Polyev. One in five chance. Five what, candidates, right. he could okay. win. Okay. <laughs> uh, why, you know, what is, what is the vulnerability of your party? Do you think that Justin Trudeau thinks he can win again against it? I think most conservatives are not disappointed. Uh, to be polite to hear the news that Justin Trudeau wants to lead the Liberal Party into another election. I think uh, among Canadians there is a stronger desire for change when we look at all the economic issues that are plaguing uh, Canadians, cost of living issues, and the only party that has the capability to replace Justin Trudeau and the Liberals by numbers, by popular support, by the fact that we're not in a, a coalition or alliance, take your pick, uh, like the NDP, is the Conservatives. And so we have the largest membership of any political party. Our financial position is exceptionally strong. We've got a great uh, team of uh, MPs. I'm getting calls from people, regardless of who the leader is, in Nova Scotia, who want to run for our party. And so I think, I think the desire for change in Canada is growing, and only our party is placed to do that. And the only thing that will be a challenge for us is uh, not staying united. But when I talk to Conservative members, we've had a good, vigorous, uh, I won't say long, because actually the, it, it may feel long to some, but this is the shortest leadership race of the three that we've had in the last five years. So it's going to be over tomorrow. We'll know who our new leader is. And most conservatives I talk to, they want to get to work to try to form a government because we need change in this country. I, I just have a few seconds left, and, and I say this with respect. You didn't really answer the question other than to <laughs> oh, say, no. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't really asking you to do a sales job for the Give me for another the shot. I was just, I was basically saying Justin Trudeau thinks he can beat, let's say, Pierre Paul, a Pierre Polyev conservative party, or he at least wants to try. What does that say to you about uh, uh, what potential vulnerability exists for your party in that scenario? I don't think most conservatives are worried about Justin Trudeau. I think they would welcome uh, a race against Justin Trudeau because he is ultimately the prime minister of high inflation, high interest rates that are coming, and Canadians who are increasingly feeling left out by a government that hasn't taken action to make life more affordable. So we'll see where the chips fall after Saturday, but, uh, and, and I feel badly that I've let you down. I haven't answered your question. I've say, tried, okay, so, I've tried. Sort of not an answer. We'll get some analysis of that in a second. You'll have to give me another shot. I will. Okay, thanks, Rob. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Rob Batchison. As I mentioned, we will get some more analysis of that. To do that, let's bring in two people who know a lot about leadership and election campaigns in Charlottetown, David Hurley, principal of the Gandalf Group and host of the Hurley Burley podcast. And here with me in Ottawa, Rubicon, Rubicon pardon me, strategy CEO and former campaign director for the Ontario PCs, 
Corey tonight. Hi, Corey. Hi, David. Hi. Good to have you both uh, here. Uh, David, I'll start off with you. It is a very, and I think it's important that we do start off on, you know, it's, we are marking, we are certainly reflecting on the Queen's passing. Uh, it's a very different, it's going to be a very, it sounds like a very different event. Do you think they made the right call to go ahead with it? Uh, I think so. I think they really had to. I mean, the votes are in, the votes have been counted. Um, and I think that uh, any attempt to delay that would have just created a lot of problems. And I, it's unfortunate that this happened, but I don't really think it's going to do much to uh, to change the nature of, of the vote, tomorrow, uh, of the nature of the way the vote is received tomorrow. And what about the nature of the vote itself? Are you anticipating, uh, I was just behind the scenes asking Corey, what's the chance of a first ballot? And he said 99.9%. Do you think that's accurate? Maybe a little low. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. Okay, so uh, so Corey, you also think, as I just uh, spoiled yeah, for everybody. Uh, yeah, it would take uh, some sort of uh, divine intervention, I think, to, uh, to to have a different outcome than the one that we're all expecting. So, you know, I, I, I don't think it'll be a dramatic uh, event. Uh, uh, obviously, people aren't going to be, be sitting waiting to, to, to see what the outcome is it, particularly, but I think they'll be waiting to see how uh, Pierre Polyev positions himself and the party in this sort of, sort of his first as elected leader uh, speech, which is, uh, you know, what I, I think uh, will be interesting to me. And what would your advice be to him for that speech? Well, I wouldn't change a lot, to be honest. Like, uh, this notion that he should be pivoting or something after this race, I, I, uh, I don't agree with. Like, I, I think uh, insofar as he has been very focused on the economy, he's been very focused on issues related to affordability, interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. You know, as, as uh, David can attest, to, you know, the, these things are, are what top every poll that's uh, been going on for, for months now in terms of what Canadians are focused on. And uh, I, I think that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has been focused on many other things, you know, uh, more values-based issues. And while those issues are important to some voters, uh, I, I think the vast majority are, are, are not seized by, you know, n new uh, additional colors and stripes on, on the pride flag as much as they are on, you know, the price of groceries right now. David, do you, do you think that's true? And do you agree with the assessment uh, of what Pierre Polyev has to do in a speech should he win tomorrow night? Well, I, you know, I, I think that Mr. Polyev is pursuing a very novel strategy in Canadian politics. And I'm not sure I'm poised to advise him on it because I don't really fully understand how to execute it myself. But I'm interested to watch it. I would say that from my perspective, there have been two Pierre Polyevs in this campaign. When he is talking about the economy, he's the most effective and compelling politician in the country right now. Um, he has a great way of talking about it. He illustrates it in a way that people understand. He seems to have a good command of the facts. It's great. When he is off on some of the more esoteric tangents um, of his campaign, I think he's one of the stranger people in Canadian politics. And so if I was him, I would present the compelling part. I would strip away a lot of that other messaging and I would be laser focused on the economy because it's by far the thing that people are most concerned about in the country. The government is not talking about it effectively. The NDP are not talking about it at all. And Mr. Polyev is taking up a lot of ground and I think making a lot of gains by doing that. I think David's point is a fair one that throughout the campaign you certainly saw uh, some things that Mr. Polyev said uh, around, let's say, I mean, first of all, even his, his support for the convoy and certain aspects of it, uh, the Bank of Canada firing thing, and then lots of that became less of what he talked about, right? And he was very focused by the end, like you said, on the stuff people are talking about right now. And I'm not yeah, positioning he, that as a pivot at he, all. I'm just saying that that's he, Yeah, that's even, even some of the more controversial things that, uh, you know, like that you mentioned, uh, some of them I don't think will be viewed uh, for some very key go voter groups as problematic. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there, there is a, a sense that not just the Bank of Canada, but central banks, uh, you know, across the Western world and in the U.S. and uh, others uh, drop the ball a bit. Uh, and you know maybe the uh, yeah I think uh, the, it's fair to in terms of how that is presented 
uh, might be a bit jarring to some people, but it, it, that's what drives headlines and gets you in the news cycle with that story. And and if it's just that, you know, are, uh, are there grounds for criticism of the central bank? Yeah, I think there are. Uh, Certainly. In, it's it's in, in a little different to say, like, fire the bank of yeah, the governor, but, the institution but, is useless, know, one, versus, like, let's assess the reaction and the response. One, one thing that we've seen in, in many campaigns, though, is you have to sometimes overstate the point. You have to go a little bit past the mark. Uh, in order to actually seize the agenda and bring an uh, issue to the fore. You know, uh, certainly uh, Donald Trump was the uh, all-time master of, uh, of doing that. Uh, not that I think that, that uh, Pierre is uh, emulating him in any other way, uh, but like, I think you can do that and have that make sense. I, I think some of the Bitcoin stuff uh, as well, like I, I, I think there's, especially for millennial voters, um, uh, a greater interest in cryptocurrencies and things like that. I think it appeals to some of, of those the, people. Less money to lose. And I think you know, <laughs> uh, old farts like uh, like uh, David and I are, are less interested in cryptocurrency. But there are, there is a constituency of people who are. Uh, uh, who are going to be more interested in that, and they're going to hear something that they want to hear on that, which is a little bit about disruption. Uh, it's a criticism of you know sort of the way things have been done in the past, and it's grounded in the fact. Uh, that we have out of control inflation, that we have interest rates that are going up, that we have a housing crisis in, in terms of the amount of housing that's being built, et cetera. Like, so I think even when he's maybe a little off the mark uh, for, uh, uh, for fancy pants commentators like, like us, <laughs> uh, I think he's still uh, you know, hitting uh, keys that are they're in the right chord. Do you think that's- Here's where I would disagree, Here's yeah, why please, I would disagree with that, Vashi. Here's where I would disagree with that. Tomorrow night, Pierre Polyev becomes the odds-on favorite to win the next election in Canada. Mm -hmm. The Trudeau government is nearing its natural end date. Ten years, eight to ten years, is when governments lose elections. The only way a government wins an election after it's been in office for ten years is because can, too many people view the alternative as, frankly, unacceptable. That's the bar. If you're just okay, you're going to win. So Polyev has all that in his favor, and all he has to do is limit the opportunities for the Trudeau liberals to paint him as an unacceptable prime minister. In 2004, Stephen Harper had left enough breadcrumbs around that we could cobble together a case that he was unacceptable, and it worked. And Mr. Polyev should be careful of that. I, 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 I agree that that's, that's probably uh, the appropriate strategy uh, for the liberals to pursue. I don't think that... Uh, that Pierre's record is going to be the problem. I think uh, what we've seen, you know, more typically is uh, folks in caucus, uh, candidates, others, you know, who uh, have been even more intemperate, and and you know, I I think those sorts of attacks are probably, um, you know, going to going to hit harder during a campaign, and and I'm sure there's there's lots to work with out there because there always is, but. Uh, but if he can, if he can just stick on the main points, I think he's going to be in a pretty good place. Uh, you know, the the other thing I, and I think David, you've talked about this many times uh, in the past. The liberals have to get onto the big topics. They have to start talking about in a in a you know in a, a way that that relates to people that they have some alternative plan uh, to deal with inflation, and to deal with mean, interest rates, mm -hmm. other than saying, you know, uh, you know we're, we're going to just try to talk about other things. people think the country is headed in the wrong direction. And yeah, yeah just a That's quick right. final word to you, David, on that, because they were going to sort of finally talk about afford new affordability measures beyond what they had already Reannounced from the budget this week, which of course, understandably, uh, didn't happen because of what happened with because of the Queen's passing. David, final word to you on that. Uh, I, I don't know what the package was going to be. I, I'd heard some rumors. It, it didn't sound like it was going to pack a lot of political punch uh, to me. Uh, and I think they more than just distributing money, though, they need to do what Polyev is doing. Polyev's talking about what's wrong. Polyev's identifying. Uh, Polyev's identifying what people are feeling. That's the first key. If you deny what people are feeling, it doesn't matter what program you announced. If you identify with people, that's the first hurdle of communications. And the government so far on the economy is out to lunch in the last six months on this. Okay. Well, lots, lots more fodder for us over the next six months. Thanks very much, David and Corey. David Hurley and Corey tonight. Appreciate both of your analysis and insights tonight. As we have been discussing, the Tories are slated to announce their new leader tomorrow with a pared-down program to reflect the Queen's passing. CBC News will be there as the results come in. Hi, 
I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.